Hi everyone, thank you for joining the seminar. Today we have our uh, guest named Heli Olson. She is a PhD student from University of Nebraska Lincoln from Nebraska. Her topic is today investigating nonlinear diffusion in the non-local vector calculus framework. Uh, you can proceed, Heli. Sounds good. Get this big. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Okay, yes. awesome. So thank you guys for having me. Um, just like was mentioned, I'll be talking about some nonlinear diffusion, but looking at it through the frame of the non-vector calculus framework. So we're gonna start kind of by thinking about what that non-local vector calculus framework is. This work is joint work that I've done with my two advisors at UNL, Michael Foss and Petronella Redu. Okay, so kind of what, what is a non-local operator? What's its point? What's its purpose? So a non-local operator, um, in comparison to what we would consider a local operator, or a classical operator, something like the divergence or a Laplacian, that looks just at one specific point, right? I can tell you the divergence of something, you know, kind of right in there at that point x. Non-local operators act sort of on the area around our point of interest. So what you're gonna see is a non-local horizon for each point. So for instance, if I was interested in this point in the middle of this gray ball here, I'm gonna get information about that point by saying, how does it react with everything that's nearby, everything in that um, Euclidean ball there that you see around the point. It doesn't always have to be that your horizon is a Euclidean ball. That's what we're gonna be seeing though in this presentation. And it's a pretty typical choice. So what that's gonna give us is we're gonna see, you know, our whole domain there, you see that domain omega, it's also gonna have in place of a boundary, this collar. So that gamma is in the same dimension as our original domain. It's gonna take place of what we would consider like the surface of our, our domain. Okay. So what, what do I do with non-local models? Why did we want to start using non-local models? Well, in place of their classical counterparts, they can describe things like multi-scale behavior. They can describe some anomalous, be um, some anomalous behavior, such as super and subdiffusion, and that gives us a lot of applications where these are, are prevalent. So they are super prevalent in paradynamics and dynamic fracturing. You're going to see it in image processing, right? If I skip straight from white to black in a black and white image, um, that discontinuity can be picked up by these non-local operators. Um, you'll see it's some multi-scale physics, um, all sorts of good things like that. So you might have noticed I mentioned, right? Having some sort of discontinuity is what it's good at, right? Because I can't find things like my classical operators on a discontinuity, right? When I have that big jump, it's not always defined there. And we'll see that discontinuity in a few different ways. So you might see it in something like this um, example here. You're imagining the sphere is maybe a balloon and I'm popping it from above and my entire surface is cracking. And so I'm having those discontinuities kind of everywhere in that domain where it's breaking apart. I could also have a continuous domain, but the um, thing that I'm looking at is changing discontinuously. So if you think maybe if I took some oil and water and I shook it up in a jar, right? It doesn't quite mix with each other. Oil and water doesn't like that. So I have each individual point is either oil or water. And I wanna be able to model what it does when it's settling down. That's something you'd imagine kind of in a scenario like this. So these operators have some other benefits and drawbacks beyond just the fact that they've got some applications. So mathematically, some benefits we get from these non-local operators. So they can act on functions that are just integrable. They don't necessarily have to be continuous or differentiable or any of those nice properties that we tend to see. As a consequence, that makes our set of possible solutions quite a bit larger. Well, we've also seen that these non-local operators, they're useful in problems in involving Sobolev spaces. And then lastly, uh, we can use the non-local framework to hopefully allow for some well-posedness in some difficult non-linear systems, um, hopefully maybe something like the Navier-Stokes equations. But just like we have some benefits, right, we always have to have a few drawbacks to go along with that. So we don't always get, really the biggest drawback is that we don't always get what we're expecting from the classical framework to carry over into that non-local framework. So one example is the non-local flash and lacks compactness. Um, or if you look at a non-local version of the Poincaré inequality, it doesn't provide a higher integrability result. Um, and then also just it's still being developed. So we don't always necessarily have like 
a disproof, you know, like how the non-local Laplacian lacks compactness. Sometimes it's just, I don't know if this works, right? Depending on the situation you're in, you don't always have a fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition, it's still kind of in the works. We're pretty sure there is one, but we're still waiting on that, that kind of thing. But we also have some benefits and drawbacks in terms of those applications and some physical interpretations. So again, that little to no differentiability is really useful for those uh, examples that we saw previously, like that dynamic fracturing we saw with the balloon or the phase separation we saw with those blue and red diagrams. The other useful thing is that, as I mentioned uh, briefly before, we can capture kind of those weird behaviors such as anomalous diffusion. And then a nice other thing is that these non-local models will actually have a lot of kind of fine tuning that you can do. They're all gonna be defined by what we refer to as the non-local kernel. You'll see it referred to as alpha in this paper. Um, and you can kind of adjust that to do precisely what you want it to do. So you can really fine tune a model that way. But then it has this drawback where, well, I can make it be anything. So now, you know, it's kind of difficult to calibrate it if I have too much, too much freedom there. And then we also have issues where, you know, that interaction horizon that we mentioned before, that delta ball, that doesn't really necessarily have a clear physical choice in terms of our applications. Um, a lot of times you just pick the delta that, you know, is easiest to compute, or maybe you pick one that you're like, I think maybe the application would do okay with this, but there's not always a clear idea of how far is too far for two points to not have an interaction. You'll also see a lot of these operators with an infinite uh, horizon because there really is no place to just cut it off. And then lastly, kind of spawned by those horizons of interaction, your um, problem requires that caller that I mentioned that's in the same dimension as your domain. And that can be difficult for your physical interpretation. Think about maybe, you know, you're doing something on a surface and you want to do something with heat propagation. Well, normally you would just need the surface. You just need to know the heat on the surface of that thing or maybe on two ends of one pole, right? In order to do a non-local system, I need some sort of volume. I need to be able to take that measurement on the whole volume, and that can be difficult to do, or if not impossible in some situations. Um, there's a whole class of thinking based on, you know, how do I interpret, you know, if I just take the boundary, could I extend it to get myself a volume so I can do non-local systems, that kind of thing. But there's not always, you know, we have issues with some clear physical choices in terms of boundary conditions and horizons, those kinds of things. So. The non-local calculus framework, there's a lot of different ways to introduce it, but usually what happens is you kind of, you pick what your gradient is gonna be and you build everything off of that. Uh, if you look into the literature, you'll see a few different options for your, for your gradient. You can see one point functions, two point functions. There's a weighted version of the gradient. There's a lot of different things going on. Um, but once you pick it, right, then you kind of move forward from there. You want those standard things to apply. You want your gradient divergence to be adjoints, right, which is actually usually how you just find what your divergence operator should be. You want your Laplacian to be the divergence of the gradient, you know, all those standard things. Right. So as I mentioned, after you, you can pick as many, grade, like, you can pick at different forms of gradients. You'll see a lot of different ones. After you pick your gradient, that gradient's also going to have of non-local kernel, which you'll see is alpha, and you can pick a wide range of those as well. So you have a lot of options here for setting these up. Okay, in particular, we're gonna be looking at the non-local gradient divergence from Duminga, Schiele, Heck, and Zell, um, a pretty standard paper from a few years ago with these operators. Um, you'll notice that they do actually take different um, dimensions in terms of input. So my divergence takes um, a one point input that gradient takes two, but you'll be able to put them together to make yourself a non-local Laplacian. Oh, non-local Laplacian comes to the slide after this, I think. Okay, so that, that kernel alpha that I mentioned, right? This is the thing that we are gonna say, this, this determines the operator essentially. How this alpha behaves tells me how two different points act towards each other essentially. Um, so how do X and Y behave? Um, are they close together? Then they should maybe be more impactful towards each other. Are they farther apart? They should be less impactful is usually how those go. So with that in mind, we have some stipulations for what that kernel is gonna look like. So I'm gonna have that alpha squared is gonna be a non-negative and rotationally symmetric function. Um, with that rotational symmetry, right? Alpha then is only gonna depend on the distance between X and Y. 
So a lot of times if you see alpha with just one input, it's going to be because it's looking at a distance. And then we also sort of have this exponential dampening condition um, where it has to get quite small as the two, fun the two points get far from each other. So what that roughly is going to look like for your kernel is that anything that lies in this gray area is fair game. Right? So it'll roughly have this idea where if the two points are close, they mean a lot to each other, you'll get that heavier weight. As they get farther away, they'll be less weighted. And then when we talk about these operators, so we're going to talk about these operators converging to things as delta gets small. And what that's going to mean is I'm taking my kernel and I'm just chopping it off. Once two points get delta apart from each other, the kernel becomes zero, the operator becomes zero. So we're going to kind of slowly shift this delta bar in so that the kernel has a smaller and smaller support. So that's going to be what's kind of happening with that kernel when we're looking at those convergence results. Now onto that normal global passion. So if I take my divergence and gradient, both of those normal global operators, and I put them together in the standard way you'd be expecting, we get a normal global Laplace operator. Um, a lot of times in this paper and in others, you'll see it kind of rewritten using that idea um, of just looking at a delta ball around a point, right? So you'll rewrite it so that the integral is just centered at zero and you're looking primarily at u of x and how it deals with points that are z away from them. Well, that's one way you'll see that a lot. Okay. Now, with this one, a, a pretty standard result you'll see for the non-local version of the Laplacian is that it converges to that standard Laplacian as that delta ball decreases. In order to do that, you do need a little bit of scaling. So I'm gonna throw out front of my non-local Laplacian this scaling function sigma delta. Um, which does depend on the action of your non-local kernel. But with that scaling, as delta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, um, we're going to localize to the same exact behavior you'd get from the classical Laplacian. Okay. We're going to use this result, we're going to leverage this result when we try and talk about convergence for our non-local operator as well. In particular, in this work, we're going to look at a specific nonlinear form. So this nonlinear diffusion operator. So you've essentially just thrown in this little um, f of u inside my divergence. So you could think about that as like maybe a temperature def dependent diffusion would, would have a form like this. Um, and we're going to look at the non-local version of that, right? So I'm just going to use that same exact formulation, but I'm going to plop in those non-local operators instead. Okay, and we're going to refer to this, the non-local version as B sub delta, just because this is, this takes up a lot of space, but B sub delta is just my non-local version of that um, non-linear diffusion. Okay. So one of the big things um, is getting that the operators converge to one another, right? So we already mentioned that the non-local Laplacian converges to its classical counterpart. We want to see a similar result for this non-linear diffusion. And we do need quite a bit of regularity in terms of the functions that we're using. So our function f has to be you know, bounded. It also has to have a bounded uh, first and second derivative. And the function u has to be fairly nice. Um, but when we do that, we do get that that non-local operator will converge to its classical counterpart. So the next part is just going to be a quick view into sort of how that proof works out. Um, not a lot of details, but just an overview of sort of that structure. So if we think about our non-local version, we're actually going to add and subtract a term to get two nice big operators here. And the second one here should actually look really familiar, right? If I took this f of u out front, which I can do, because it only depends on x, not on y, I'm left with that non-local Laplace operator. So then I can leverage that previous result about the non-local Laplacian in order to get the convergence. And then what I'm left to do is try and get you know, something useful out of the first term. So if I can get this form out of that first term there, right, adding those two together, I'll get back to the, the classical version, the divergence of f of u, the gradient of u. Okay. So like I mentioned, right, the second term converges using that result that we saw a couple of slides ago, that the non-local uh, Laplacian converges to its classical counterpart. This term does converge at a rate of delta squared, which we got from that proof for leveraging. But then with the other one, 
it ends up working out a little less nice. Um, so one of the big tools we use here is actually we're going to do a Taylor expansion a few times with a lot of these different terms and then get a whole bunch of the terms to disappear. Um, a lot of times they disappear because you can pull out deltas, right? So I'm integrating over the ball of radius delta. This alpha um, has an exponential dampening, which depends on delta, you know, that kind of nice stuff. The unfortunate thing though, is that the other integral only converges at a rate of delta. So we were really hoping that it would converge at the same rate as that standard Laplacian, but it turns out when you include that f of u in there, our rate decreases. So we actually only get convergence here at a rate of delta. Okay. And then it turns out using those same exact assumptions, right, we can use, leverage that pointwise convergence and get an L2 convergence of the operators as well. Okay, but we're not gonna stop just at those operators. We also wanna look at some solutions to systems using this operator. So we're gonna compare the standard version of the operator, right? The divergence of f of u, the gradient of u in the classical case. Then we're also gonna look at solutions to just using that non-local version instead. And so this u will be the solution you see in the standard case. Then moving forward, u to the delta, that'll be the solution to our non-local case. Okay. So, Leveraging results from um, a paper from my advisors and one of their old students, Corey Wright, uh, we do actually have at least one solution to that non-local system, which is important in terms of moving forward with talking about it at all. And we do have to satisfy um, those kernel assumptions A1 through A3, and F and U also have to satisfy those bounds from that convergence result. But then using that, and maybe a couple of other bounds that look a little bit confusing, but ignore those for a second. Using um, some bounds and some nice things, we do get L2 convergence of those two solutions to one another. So as delta gets small, those two uh, solutions converge to one another in L2 space. The other conditions we need are essentially that F needs to be big enough. Um, it needs to not disappear anywhere is really how this is gonna work out. So we have all those same conditions from before, alpha needs to be nice, U and F need to have some derivatives and they need to be bounded. And then we're also gonna need um, that if I take the infimum of my function F of U, uh, it has to be larger than essentially some terms that depend on my choice of F and U. Um, the result here for this convergence relies pretty heavily on a non-local point for inequality. So if you're interested in that, I recommend checking out this paper, which you can find on the archive. I'm using that was really integral in, in figuring out that convergence. And that's, that's what I've got for you. We've got this non-local diffusion. Uh, we did some convergence, not only of the operator, but also of some solutions there to those systems. Um, and hopefully moving forward, we'll get convergence of an even wider set of some non-linear uh, operators in that non-local calculus framework. Okay, thank you so much. Let me stop the recording.